The adventure continues, thanks largely to the fact that Emily is ovulating. So is it a coincidence this couple had sex at the perfect moment during her most fertile and sperm-friendly monthly period? This man doesn't think so. For evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey Miller, nothing in the great sperm race happens by accident. The sperm didn't get there by chance. The woman's body and brain has arranged for it to be there. It's made choices in its life, in its mate search, in its discrimination between male partners, in its sexual behavior that led to the sperm being there. Female choice runs evolution, largely. Unlike men, who can produce millions of sperm every day, women are born with all the eggs they will ever have, about a million. By menopause, that number has fallen to zero, making them the most important commodity in the natural world. A fertile egg from a healthy, intelligent egg donor costs about $30,000 on the open market. If you take the size of the egg, that adds out to about $1,000 trillion per pound. So even in strictly economic terms, a fertile egg is rare, it's special, it's valuable. Each egg is made even more precious because one will appear for just a few days per month. Many female animals make the most of ovulation by experiencing estrus, where their physical appearance, scent and behavior will change to advertise their fertility. Jeffrey Miller believes women do the same thing. It used to be thought that humans uniquely lost estrus, that human females don't go into estrus when they ovulate, that somehow we have this pair bond that trumps estrus. But in fact, the new research is showing human females do go through estrus. It serves exactly the same functions that it does for other mammals. All the same hormones, all the same psychology is still right there under the surface of human culture. So could women effectively go on heat every month? Could their reproductive systems be unconsciously controlling their actions and men's responses? Miller believes so, and to prove it, he and his team at the University of New Mexico have carried out some extraordinary research at a gentleman's club. We know that lap dancers' earnings fluctuate a lot, so it seemed like an ideal setup for being able to ask them how much have you earned night by night, shift by shift, and to be able to track that in relation to where they are in the menstrual cycle. And we thought that was a pretty cool way of, of quantifying female attractiveness to males. The dancers provided Miller's team with information about their earnings and menstrual cycles over a period of 300 work shifts, the equivalent of about 5,000 lap dancers for their male customers. The results were surprisingly strong. I, w I was amazed at how strong the effects were that the women in estrus were earning about twice as much as they were earning when they were menstruating. If you're ovulating, you're a lot more attractive to men, you're earning higher tips, you're getting called over for more lap dances. Miller's research suggests a link between female ovulation and attractiveness to men. But if women are unconsciously controlling men's actions once a month, what actually happens? They're more sexually proceptive, higher sex drive, more interest in sex. They dress in more stylish and revealing clothing. Their voice pitch gets more attractive to men. Breasts become more symmetrical. Um, the waist to hip ratio changes so that waists get relatively thinner. There are also changes in smell so that a woman's scent will become more attractive to men during estrus. So, with a little help from the unconscious power of ovulation, the great sperm race continues. 250 million of Glenn's battling sperm entered the vagina. Just 3,000 have made it through the dark, twisted hell of the cervix which now opens out into an environment that is altogether different. 
as sperm expert Dr. Alan Pacey knows. If you or I were a sperm, entering the uterus would be quite a sight. Sperm's point of view, the uterus represents a vast plane across which they have to navigate and find at the other end actually quite a tiny opening that will lead them through to the fallopian tubes. Scaled up to sperm people size, the uterus becomes a large area of open countryside, two miles long and around half a mile wide. For our sperm, finding the entrance to the fallopian tubes, just a few sperm head wide, is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Once again, it's ovulation to the rescue. Ovulation occurs on one side one month, the other side another month. So on the times that the egg is going to be ovulated from the ovary on the left, the uterus seems to preferentially move material to the left-hand side. So the sperm are probably carried to a large degree by these muscular contractions and moved through the uterus relatively quickly. But on this journey, nothing is ever that easy. Glenn's sperm are about to discover they are not alone. They're running straight into an ambush. The primary function of the uterus is, of course, to receive the developing embryo should conception occur and to gestate the fetus throughout pregnancy. It's not really designed for sperm, it's designed for something else. It will almost certainly begin to contain leukocytes and the immune response will be mounted to try and mop up sperm and to try and kill the sperm before they get to the fallopian tubes. Leukocytes are the assassins of the female body. Blood cells commanded into action by the immune system, massing into the uterus in their thousands with murderous intent. In comparison to sperm, leukocytes are quite large. They're big cells. They often hunt in packs. They will detect a sperm and many leukocytes will descend upon the sperm and encapsulate it and dismantle it slowly. For the female body, of course, leukocytes are wonderful and essential things, fighting disease and harmful foreign materials. But let's try and imagine them from the perspective of a trespassing sperm. Once again, Glenn's sperm face utter decimation, as thousands are killed by Emily's immune system. Just a few dozen lucky ones reach the entrance to the fallopian tubes. 
only to find there is a strict door policy. Sperm have to display the correct swimming characteristics in order to get through that uterotubule junction. And any sperm expressing a very random form of motion is probably excluded. There's also potentially a molecular recognition system there. So only sperm that are expressing the right molecules actually are allowed through. Sperm have faced death and destruction in the uterine cavity. The leukocytes have been trying to uh, kill them along the way. And only a lucky few, in comparison to the many millions that are ejaculated initially, actually make it into the fallopian tubes, where finally they get to sperm heaven. Welcome to one of Emily's fallopian tubes. Ten centimeters of what can only be described as paradise for sperm. The environment of the fallopian tube is just very accommodating for sperm. It's what sperm have been aiming for, and it's set up to try and maintain sperm health, and they can have a rest. It's got nutrients for them, it's got the right pH, it has the right ion concentration. And some of these sperm will actually bind to the fallopian tube cells. Their membranes will become very closely associated so that the fallopian tube cells can pass nutrients and sugar and protect those sperm. Scientists believe, with no immune system trying to kill them, sperm can blissfully hang around in the fallopian tubes for hours, even days. But ultimately, it's hard to know for sure. At the farthest reaches of the reproductive tract, the fallopian tubes are very difficult to study. So difficult, in fact, some scientists are willing to go to extraordinary lengths. When I was done having children, I chose to have my tubes tied, and I told my doctor that I wanted to do an experiment where I had intercourse before I had the surgery, and then she was to cut out that section of my uh, fallopian tubes where the sperm are stored so that I could look at them under the electron microscope and count how many sperm were there. So it was pretty humorous, actually, because I'm coming out of anesthesia, and I was like, did you get it? Did you get it? Because it, no one had ever done this before. Entering the uterus would be quite a sight. 